Welcome back, everybody. Hope you're all caffeined up, ready for the final stretch of the program today. Um, first of all, I'm going to check if the clicker is working. It is not. <laughs> but I was able to find out that it's Google's fault <laughs> that the clicker wasn't working because we were using Google Slides <laughs> live. Google Slides and also Wi-Fi. All right. Thanks very much. So I'm going to talk a little bit about expanding our constituencies. I'm the Director of Member and Community Outreach at Crossref, and I think I'm going to change my title to just Director of Communities because, of course, our membership is a huge part of our community. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, and some of the activities we're doing to um, interact with members and users in new countries and also in new sort of um, segments. Um, and the other thing to say about that is actually it's not, it's not like Crossref is uh, expanding our constituencies um, before our own benefit. The constituencies and the community is expanding and we are responding to that. We're responding to, to our members evolving. Um, so here's a chart. Use the clicker, Ginny. Here's a chart um, that shows the number of accounts that we have at Crossref and the growth over... Um, the last 18 years. So the red graph shows the total number of accounts, we've, accounts that we've managed each year. So, so far in 2018, we have 12,500 um, records in our CRM system. And so far this year, we've had 21,000 new people join the Crossref community. About 11,500 of those are members, and the others are metadata users. Um, and service providers and others. So I'll talk a little bit about who makes up the Crossref community. Um, these organizations, these types of organizations will be very familiar. These are the organizations that started Crossref. Uh, publishers, of course, very established, large publishers. And you won't be surprised that we have members who are university presses and society publishers as well. In recent years, we've also seen interesting other types of organizations join. Um, for example, governmental departments from lots of different countries, NGOs have joined as members of Crossref. Um, for example, the United Nations is a member, the International Labor Union is a member, uh, the World Bank is a member, and they are tending to register things like reports, uh, technical reports, and um, guideline documents and things like that. Increasingly, uh, we're also seeing libraries join as publishers, so library publishers and individual faculties. And we're having to start um, asking on application, did you know that your neighbor next door in, in the University of um, Colorado also has a Crossref membership? Would you like to have a conversation with them and combine? So um, it's interesting as well to note that um, we're, we're seeing individual scholars starting journals. Um, so I think they're sometimes called academic-led journals. And these are joining, these groups are joining for a, an individual journal to sign up to Crossref so that they can register their metadata and get in on the, uh, the, the reference uh, linking um, action. Um, we also have museums as members, and we have a couple of news agencies even. Uh, Bloomberg is a member. Uh, they register... Uh, metadata for their conferences. And speaking of conferences, what we're looking to more in the future, we're getting a lot of interest from pharmaceutical companies who want to register metadata with Crossref and conference organizers as well. Uh, funders as well is also another group who've been talking with existing members and coming to Crossref looking for um, uh, uh, metadata interaction and links. I'll talk a little bit more about funders shortly. Um, so other accounts that we have at Crossref that aren't necessarily members, I've sort of lumped them all in together, but you could name any. So manuscript tracking systems, we work very hard to work, to work with them. Uh, hosting platforms, all sorts of aggregators, um, archives, um, and authors actually themselves. Of course, they're not necessarily members, but we deal with them on a regular basis when they come to us asking, can we correct their spelling of their name in the metadata record, for example. And any 
number of other types of organizations Crossref is now interacting with, and it's only growing. Um, so, um, who uses our metadata? I think you've seen this slide in the Bigger Ambitions room. Um, Jennifer Kemp has been talking to that. And really, the answer is all of these, all of our members, all of the constituencies, all of the aggregators, the hosting platforms, and the authors themselves, and the publishers, all are relying on the metadata from Crossref. Um, I thought it would be interesting just to look at the makeup of the um, audience today. So this is a breakdown of um, delegates for Crossref Live 18 and how they have categorized themselves. So they could, have, they could pick more than one category. And we had lots of people who said, I'm a librarian and a researcher and a metadata user. Um, but it's interesting to note, even when, when aggregating those, that 30% or 29.3% of the people in the room um, said that they were a publisher. 27.4% uh, said they were a tool or a service. Um, and uh, researchers, 18%. 13% of you are librarians and 11% metadata users, which again is making up all of those other segments as well. So um, we've been uh, seeing expansion in Crossref beyond publishers for a number of years, um, but we never really sort of formalized that until July this year when our uh, board um, approved changes to our bylaws. Um, previously, the incorporation documents for Crossref talked about um, scientific, technical, and medical publishers, but clearly we've had humanities and social science publishers join for many, many years. Um, it also talked about publishers, and you'll notice that this new phrase that was approved by the board doesn't contain the word publisher. It's now eligibility for Crossref is organizations that produce professional and scholarly materials and content. So we're really just um, clarifying what was already happening at Crossref, and it also enables us to um, welcome new groups. And I'll talk about the funding community in a minute. But first, I want to talk about um, what's happening in lots of different countries. So we have, um, when we talk about expanding constituencies, it's not just different types of organizations, it's lots of different countries. Um, we have members and um, accounts in 118 countries, and I don't even know how many languages that might cover. Um, so we're now trying to service those uh, members in different countries with different languages, but also um, having to understand what the makeup of, um, you know, the, the different kind of characteristics that are particular to those countries, what their governments are mandating, for example. Um, so this chart shows the new members by country, uh, the top countries so far in 2018. So I think I showed it had about 2,000, we have about 2,000 members newly joining this year so far, and these are the countries they're coming from. So the, the fastest growing country is Indonesia, and we have been there and visited them and talked to their Ministry of um, Science and Education, and we realized that these hundreds of new members coming from Indonesian universities, actually, are, um, have been told by their higher-ups that they need to get DOIs, and that's what, the, what, that's what they've been told to do, so they've been told to join Crossref and get DOIs. So we have to um, have a conversation with them and say, do you, do you want to go beyond DOIs? Do you want to register um, more metadata? Do you know that it's a kind of um, a commitment for the, for the long haul? So we're doing a lot more kind of education um, before and at the point of application from new members. Uh, Croatia has just made the, the bottom of that list there, but also we're also seeing lots of members um, still coming from the United States and the UK, which maybe would have been more, are more traditional publishing countries. So how are we dealing with all that? Well, of course, we have a team of people um, at Crossref, but we're pretty small. Uh, we can't cover 118 countries. Um, so, we do work with ambassadors. Uh, this is a new program that we started, launched um, by Vanessa in my team in January. And we have 16 ambassadors so far, and four of them are here. Um, I know Lauren from JSTOR, if you want to wave. She's, she's covering the United States. <laughs> um, and we've also got uh, Wei Fu from uh, 
Singapore, the same table there. Um, and a special shout out as well to Edilson from Brazil. <laughs> and um, also um, uh, Ali from Colombia. And Edilson and Ali have um, worked really, really hard, especially this year. We've been co-running events with them. They've been helping us translate materials. Um, and, you know, they were looking to talk about infrastructure and metadata and persistent identifiers in and amongst their community and for their work anyway. And we're formalizing that arrangement by making them a, um, a Crossref ambassador. So welcome to you all. And here is, okay, Google's against me again. There we go. Um, this is actually a tiny little uh, poster on the wall there. I don't know if you may, you may have missed it, but this is our 16 ambassadors around the world. You'll see lots in um, Asia and Australia and South America. And that's really reflecting where lots of our new members are coming from and where we, just, we need to learn more about what those markets need. Um, so, for example, we've also been uh, running not just events in person, but also many, many webinars. So this is, our, our, I think, our third webinar we've run in Arabic. Um, here's an example of a video uh, um, that we've had translated into Korean. So we have all of our videos for all of our services available in 11 different languages now. And the ambassadors and sponsors, I'll come to those later, have been hugely, um, hugely helpful in helping us, helping that take shape. Um, so I know we've done webinars as well in Russian, in Indonesian, in Malay, in Arabic, I mentioned. Um, and these webinars are attracting hundreds of, of sign-ups as well. So it's, um, the word is getting out there. There's definitely an interest. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit now uh, back again to um, sort of the accounts account management, if you like, at Crossref, the traditional roles are shifting. So the publishers that maybe founded Crossref sometimes aren't even calling themselves publishers anymore. They might be more interested in analytics, or they might be looking to offer services to other publishers. So up until recently, and still now actually, this is more or less how we have been categorizing the different accounts at Crossref. And you'll see, and this is obviously quite um, topical because we have the election today, but on the left are the groups of types of accounts that are eligible to vote in our board election, and on the, on the right are the ones that don't get a vote. Um, and you'll see, of course, member. If you're a direct member, that's really clear and easy. That's the top left uh, blue box. Um, we have this sponsors program, and essentially they are like sort of parent-child relationships. Um, if you're a publisher and you sponsor other publishers, you act on their behalf and do lots and lots of things on their behalf. Um, however, you may also be not a publisher, but representing publishers and able to curate XML, able to um, interact with Crossref, able to offer local technical support in local languages. Um, they represent small, generally smaller, publishers who can't join Crossref directly, um, either because they don't have the technical skills or they don't have the funds available to them. Um, so those individual ones do get a vote, but their sponsor, who isn't a publisher and doesn't publish anything, does not get the vote. And of course we have service providers, and actually what we're seeing is that some traditional members are also acting in a service provider role or in a sponsor role. So we're having to kind of rethink how we're categorizing our accounts. Um, and I know, you know our board is, as you probably know, meeting this week um, uh, on Thursday. And uh, Lisa, after this talk, will be talking a little bit about what their um, governance committee has been discussing as well, about how we can kind of rethink, rethink these, um, these segmentations. Um, here's another chart. Um, showing some growth with those different types of accounts that I just showed you. And you'll see that in 2018, for the first time, we had more sponsored members, so people who were being represented by somebody else, join Crossref than direct members. So this is a definitely a growing trend. And some of the things that accounts might do for each other, and this is, as I'm, as I'm um, 
you know, talking with the different people around the room, and we know there's, you know, 30% of you said that you were publishers um, and maybe ticked a lot of other boxes as well as that. Um, here are some of the things that we think that the Crossref um, accounts are doing for each other, and sometimes they are financial. For example, three of our sponsors represent um, emerging publishers in low and lower income countries. So PKP, um, INASP, and the African Journals Online, they are sponsoring um, members who um, represent publishers that couldn't otherwise join Crossref. And sometimes they cover the fees or we have an arrangement with them where we waive the fees. Sometimes um, the sponsors will pass on the fees and we don't know what they may charge them. Um, but a lot of times we find what they're offering are technical support. So they will do the registering of the content with Crossref. They might follow up on the error reports that we send out, uh, conflict reports and things like that. Um, they may be um, content host, hosting platforms that might also offer some of these other um, actions or activities. Um, they definitely mostly will offer local language support. Um, and sometimes they will take business decisions for Crossref. For example, policy decisions like um, are their references going to be set to closed, limited, or open? Um, and some of them get to vote in the board elections on behalf of others, and some don't. So right now with the sponsors program, we have 48 sponsoring organizations in total. So these are... Um, these are organizations that are not members as such, they don't get the vote um, in 20, across 20 different countries. So they do provide support, both billing and technical, um, training, lots of awareness about Crossref activities and services. Um, and yeah, they're representing publishers who may not otherwise be included in Crossref. And as we've seen, they partner with us on live local events. They might run help desks and um, they, I don't think it's, it's, it's too difficult to um, underestimate the, um, the cost it is to service some of these tiny um, publishers that may not have the technical ability. We have three technical support staff. Um, we're not looking to have 30 technical support staff. That's just not what Crossref is, is aiming for at all. Um, but we're trying to sort of calculate what is the cost of actually um, responding to a ticket. Um, and we think... I haven't got the figures right yet, but we think that these sponsors are actually saving Crossref a lot of money in administration costs and support costs. So now getting on to some of the new constituents. Um, talked a lot about the um, geographic changes. Um, so I'd like to talk about a new segment that we're working with. Um, and um, clearly... Funders, as everybody knows, and institutions are increasingly getting more involved in the publishing process. So as these, this sort of landscape changes, they're more interested in us, and our members have told us that we should be engaging with, with them more directly. So um, one quote here is from our strategic session with the board in July 2017, so just over a year ago, almost a year and a half ago. Um, Crossref is faced with bridging the perspectives and needs of publishers and funders. Crossref requires increased emphasis on funders, understanding their needs and requirements, and increasingly including funders in the scholarly communication dialogue. The focus should turn to services increasingly of interest to the funding community. So we've been working um, all year to revive the funder advisory group um, that was set up originally several years ago for the funder registry. And at that time, they weren't necessarily ready to think about registering grants, but they are now. Uh, so we have a grant ID working group. The board will be thinking about this and voting on a proposal on Thursday. And here's a quote from the welcome uh, in the UK. Um, Currently, researchers are typically asked to manually disclose what outputs have arisen from their funding. In the future, such disclosures could be fully automated. If a global ID system for grants were developed, 
Publishers and repositories, repositories could require these to be disclosed on submission, and this data could then be programmatically passed to researcher assessment platforms. And actually, not just researcher assessment platforms, if we can make connections between the grants and the grantees and the outputs of that funding, um, then not only are we positioning Crossref to be a, a much more valuable infrastructure player, um, but we're also enabling everybody in the Crossref community, including our members, to just make a lot more connections I think I've covered all of that. Yeah, we're collaborating with DataSight on that. And we're also in touch with ORCID has this Orbit working group, which is sort of doing a lot of research amongst funders. So we're working really closely with them. Uh, the technical uh, subgroup of the grant ID work has um, a draft scheme in place. Patricia's obviously lead leading on that. Um, and we've had funders um, and also organizations that work with, with funders help us um, uh, document what sort of information they're collecting and would be interested in sharing and we're mapping that to the Crossref schema so we can start to over the next few months show what sort of connections will be possible when we have grant IDs and Crossref. Have I gone over my time? <laughs> yes. Okay, we won't talk about a focus. <laughs> Yes, we will, quickly. Um, very quickly, I know Isaac already talked about open support this morning. Um, we set up a year ago a whole group under my group, um, all focused around the experience that these accounts are getting. So we want to aim for a public, joined up, responsive and proactive support and education program in context from original application or inquiry through to all of our advanced services, exceeding the expectations of our community, who understands the collective gain of good quality metadata. And just a couple of things. Isaac already talked about the open support um, plan that he's working on. Um, already this year, we have improved the application process. We have a lot of um, pre-join education, as I mentioned. We do regular, um, what Anna Tolwinska calls health checks, which is essentially um, walking our members through their reports, their conflict reports, their participation reports and others. Um, we introduce new membership terms that are much easier to understand, uh, potentially translatable into other languages. Um, and of course, they're, not, they're out of the legal language now and they're much, much easier to um, to understand and we're finding actually that members when they're joining are now asking us more about their obligations because they're actually seeing what they are now. Um, and we also instituted a, an incident response process um, so that we can be more transparent when some of our services are not meeting um, our standards and we have a live status page at status.crossref.org and you can sign up for um, updates there. Um, Isaac mentioned we're planning a community forum, um, an education strategy led by Laura Wilkinson, and yeah, some, some uh, the start of thinking about some more self-help tools so that members can do some of the um, uh, metadata administration themselves. Uh, for example, title transfers um, at the end of the year, we're getting them in now. January is title transfer month. <laughs> um, and it's a very, very manual process. So um, I think uh, Jennifer will talk about Metadata Manager uh, tomorrow. And recently introduced to that was a much more automated way of um, doing title transfers through that online service. So not only will that be easier for members to control, um, but it will take a little bit of manual effort away from our staff. And finally, I'm gonna finish. Um, here they are, the outreach team. Um, at the top there, there's the communications team. That's Chrissy and Rosa. And shout out to Rosa at the back who's put this whole event together and has been... <laughs> She's been on the phone to customs and <laughs> all sorts of people trying to get things here this week. Um, and I won't introduce everybody, but um, ask me more afterwards. Thank you.